Good afternoon from Alexandria, Virginia. Nice August summer day. Aloha, Hapa Day. I'm Ricky Ellison. I'm the founder and chairman of the Missile Defense Advocacy Alliance. We have been founded for 20 years. Um, always fun with, with the Oppenheimer movie. Uh, I did get a chance to get lectured by Edward Teller and had some time with Edward Teller back in 1980 when they were forming the Strategic Defense Initiative with the High Frontier and the President uh, Ronald Reagan. Um, so this is our 53rd virtual congressional series. This is on a great topic. It is on the missile defense of Guam and the urgency that has to be behind it. Guam missile defense is about deterrence. It is about preventing a world war. It's not fighting a world war, it is preventing a world war by changing the Chinese calculus on what they can and can't do in the Pacific. The last world war we were in, both Guam and Hawaii started that world war. Both Guam and Hawaii weren't prepared, weren't defended, and both commanders, as you know, were Admiral Kimball and Major General Short were removed from command. That's why, and it hasn't changed, the importance of the United States' ability to project power in the Indo-Pacific region has not changed. It's from those two locations. And Guam is the closest in the second island chain to the threats that we face. So without hesitation, without doubt, that has to be defended across a multi-layered system. And let's also step back and see because we were there in 2013 when we, when Harry Harris, and I think some of you worked for Harry Harris, made the decision to put that on that island. And it was controversial back then. And China went after it. And we did that. The Army did it. They put it in quick. And that prototype was so good that we put it in Korea in 2015. And we integrated it into Korea today into into a capability much more than what that is, and it should be obviously in Japan. But we've been there. We've, we have been in Guam. We've held six missile defenders a year for Guam. We've been engaged with the governor during this whole process. So now we're here. We have invested, we have made the decision politically from the highest level all the way down to fund and put forward an architecture for Guam. And what is concerning for us is that it's not moving fast enough. What is concerning for us is that this may not be in full operation with all layers until 2032, 2034. So we have to get after it. And I, I want to just go over a couple things here that concern us. Hypersonic glide defense. Where is that? It's not in that architecture. It's not in development. It's in a very small percentage of MDA's budget to develop. It is not projected to be operational until that time frame. And with that is HPTSS, because you have to have space sensors up there in that layer. And MDA's got two going up as a demonstrate, but you need to have 30, you need to have 40, you need to have 60. That's got to be in play to see the threat. That can be in play in the 29, but that doesn't seem like that's going forward fast enough. And to, and to build up this type of architecture without hypersonic defense until 32 puts you in a very tough situation on defending that island from China. I think the other concern 
is that this is not going to be a test bed. This can't be a test bed with incremental capabilities coming in here. It can't. We have to have capacity of capability. And I know, I mean, I, saw, I was in Huntsville. I was in Huntsville with you, Brian. And probably the best presentation was General Rashid, Lieutenant General Rashid's presentation. And Frank was on. I mean, they, it looks great. Everything looks great. It's on paper. It looks great. But that's got to be reality. And it looks like IBCS is not there yet. And we got to wait for IBCS. And I think the specific Army systems, like the LTAMs, like the A3, like the FPIC, all have to wait until IBCS is certified to go. It's not certified to go yet. And so that puts everything else in jeopardy to some extent to have a full system. So that, that's a concern. There's a concern on the capacity of the systems and the effectors. You can't fight without that kind of capacity. We don't see that in the fight up. We don't see that coming out for the actual interceptors to link into that. And the other missing requirement, which has not been fulfilled, a requirement from indo pacom is overhead persistent 360 degree surveillance. The JLAN's a, a, a dirigible, a balloon. It's not in the architecture. What, what, you, you, you're gonna rely on towers with, with the radars on top of them to look over the sea on, on, on maneuvering sea um, missiles? So, so there, there are some serious hurdles here that we've got to get through. But there are some great silver bullets. And I had a chance to see a couple of them. That, that, that MRC truck, the mid-range, is in play for the offense. It's in play firing both Tomahawk and SM6s. It can go. It can be delivered. We've got all the VLS we want. There's so much VLS we got. So that... That's there. That capability is there off of Aegis, and it can work today with the one radar. And that radar is coming in, I believe, is in, uh, in December for that test. But that that system has some ability to mass up. So that, that's that's where we're at. That's the discussion of trying to move our ability to um, deploy a full capability with capacity to deter China to change its calculus. And that's our discussion today on that. So um, very honored to have Major General Brian Gibson with us. Uh, Brian was over in Guam in some of these big briefings with the public and heard they went very well. He also was, was with us and I just love him for it. He did it last year in doing our into a PACOM Missile Defender of the Year with Admiral Foligno. We did that two weeks ago together, and that was an awesome event with awesome leaders, and that's how you win with people. And, and so he has been in a lot of positions, but he is probably in the most coveted missile defense position in the world, the 94th. Uh, the, 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 the leaders in the 94th have gone on to be four-star generals, three-star generals. It is the most important missile defense position out of all the double AMDCs in the world. And ladies and gentlemen, Major General Brian Gibson. Thanks, Ricky. Wow, with that introduction, I better make sure today, at least I focus on today. Um, but no, serious, it's good spending time with you. Thanks for the invite and for the other guests on the net. Uh, thanks for letting the guy in uniform still be, be part of the conversation. Um, as Ricky said, I, I do get the privilege to serve in Honolulu um, as the commander of the 94th. Army Air Missile Defense Command, and just a quick refresher that I've got two chains of command. One is a command chain. I'm an Army headquarters assigned to United States Army Pacific under General Flynn. I'll serve as Title 10 things that have to occur. And then a warfighting um, responsibility and dual hat is the Deputy Air Defense Commander for General Wilsbach and Pacific Air Forces, um, which really is the the day-to-day -day tactical control of our sensors, our shooters, and our C2. So uniquely positioned, hopefully, to provide some, some thoughts as I've been doing this about 14 months in this position and has watched this from inside the theater, as you described, um, how we're here today. But just a couple top-level thoughts before um, we, we move on. You know, General Flynn likes to say America's day begins on Guam. And unless you're out here, I think that's hard to internalize, visualize, um, and to deal with, but it is our homeland. 
And it's not like it's another country that we have a mutual defense treaty with and an alliance. It is our homeland. So I think as you saw through um, the public scoping sessions over the past couple of weeks, that they did go fairly well um, and they were open and they were honest. Uh, this has to be a team activity, and it has to be a team activity at the pace of the populace and the pace of the government leadership as well um, on the island. So as we collectively try to bring to bear a system, um, I think it's important um, to stay focused on uh, this isn't an us versus we activity from Washington, D.C. all the way to the island. This is an activity in defense of our homeland. Um, and I think, you know, Admiral Nimitz would probably roll over in his grave, given his headquarters is there and his former quarters are there, if we didn't ap approach it that way um, as we go forward with Guam. You know, the other thing is that um, it, I think it's the confluence of potential adversary activity that really, given Guam's location, is so important. You know, last year, just from a missile perspective, um, China, Russia, and DPRK did the most launches they've ever done in history, right? That's an easy talking point, um, <clears throat> excuse me. But this year, and on similar paces, I'm not as concerned about the numbers. They are what they are. It's the capabilities that they're demonstrating. Um, and whether it's longer ranges, faster speeds, more maneuverability, solid rocket motors versus liquid rocket motors, um, and demonstrating in all domains, just not in the missile domain, but in the maritime domain, you saw a couple weeks ago, we had a combined um, surface action group from Russia and China flow up through the Bering Sea and then down further south back into the mid-Pacific. Um, we've had um, continual activity in the South China Sea in the maritime domain from the PRC and the second Thomas Shoals with the Philippines um, and trying to continue to impose their will throughout the AOR on things that they believe they lay claim to. Um, I think you also see, though, that the, um, the activities and the growth of the PRC alone, my words, remain shocking. And I don't think it shocks everybody else. Inside the military, it's shocking because I don't know why you create a military means at that magnitude and that level of capability unless you intend to use it. Deterrence matters, right? Um, and that's why we're talking about today and what we're doing. But in my mind, the capabilities, just not defensively, that they continue to get after, but offensively, they can range much further than just Taiwan. And um, you look at shots from DPRK towards Midway last year, you look at the capabilities that China continues to get at to try and range Hawaii, well past Guam, I think this is a right discussion about what do we do about Guam. Um, so I don't see inside the theater over this last 14 months um, anything other than to, to um, endorse the necessity, the urgency, and the speed to get after placing land-based air and missile defense capability on that island. But I'd also be remiss if I didn't also talk about real quickly, you know, the character of war changes as new capabilities and leaders um, come into play. Pacific's still massive, right? Geography doesn't change generally. Uh, leaders and capabilities do. And uh, today, land and the capabilities the U.S. is developing, has land forces have real opportunity to demonstrate some sea control potentially, where in the past we haven't. So this idea of projecting power, defending land spaces, those kind of things, it <coughs> is important and we shouldn't just um, automatically say things are only defensive only because our capabilities today provide a range of options and flexibilities in our future on in the past where that didn't um, that wasn't provided. So, you know, it's a real privilege to, to serve in the environment. I walk the ground to Guam about once every two or three months and um, the environment remains harsh. The typhoon that recently hit a couple months ago. Um, that will take years to recover, um, mm -hmm. not only publicly, but inside a military line. So when we develop these things, the operating environment in and of itself will get a vote also. So with that, I'll stop there, and um, I look forward to the rest of the discussion. Thanks, Ricky.
Hey, Brian, thanks. I just got a question for you just to, to roll out on it. Um, can you just sort of walk through because Army has been given the task to put this architecture together and Army has to have tasking authority over all the services and the resource to, to do it. But is Army also doing the operations of this or are you still figuring that out? And all that stuff there seems to be slowing everything down or checking it. Can you comment on that if we're moving fast enough and with yeah. the environmental studies? If we're gonna get yeah. there on time? Yeah, so for context first, and I'll answer directly your question. We in the United States Army are done putting things temporarily into the Pacific, that term permanent, and there's not the rest of the dot mill PFP tail to support its operation. Um, and I think if you were to ask General Flynn, he would state it even more bluntly. Um, but we do things rightfully for right direction at the time. Um, even, on, even when we put Thad on the island or Thad in Korea or you Patriot down in Okinawa, you pick. There's a range of things. Many of these things were put in for the right reason at the time under temporary conditions without any type of permanency thought about. And even to this day, we still struggle with, because of the processes, the bureaucracy and the direction, to become more permanent when we know we're not taking these things off of the locations where we put them, even decades ago. As an example, it took us over nine years to get running water for the Thad battery on Guam. And that, I won't go any further, but that, that underpins, I think, this idea from the Army that we're very serious to make sure this is a full dot mill PFP thought about other than the things that these capabilities really provide, which is important. So now more broadly or more specifically to answer your question. Yes, the, the DEPSEC DEF gave uh, direction um, recently. That direction was stand up USD ANS as the senior defense official. And then also designate the Army as a senior acquisition executive um, for the Defense of Guam system. But the, it's an ACAT 1D program to stay underneath the oversight of OSD. A lot of, a lot of minutia there, but I, I think what that highlights to you is DOD, we're still gonna, we're still gonna keep our finger on, in um, understanding, assessing, and making decisions. Also as a function of that um, guidance, it was Army, come back to me, the DEPSEC DEF, um, in the near term with a, your analysis of what it will take to include throughout the full DOTMO PFP to, to um, field this weapon system. So yes, the Army's gonna have a responsibility, I think with the rest of the joint force and joint stakeholders to provide context on other than just the ones and zeros of a weapon system capability. Thanks, Brian. Is that gonna take more time to, to, to deliver a fully operational capability, that, that kind of politics, along with the, who's going to be in charge of the operations of it. Yeah, there's a lot of decisions still to be made. You know, Ricky, it's, I, I think General Thomas may say something about it, but we've only been at this really for about a year. And I know years a long time, and um, urgency always matter given the threat as I laid out. Who knows if it'll take more time or not. Today we know there's a director from DEPSEC DEF, come back and tell us. That's okay. what the team is working on. And I think decision makers will will take that as they always do to try to best understand as um, future decisions will be made. Could it slow things down? There's a lot of coulds that happen in our military, right? Either intended or unintended for the right and wrong reasons. And I, this is no different. Okay. Th thank you, Brian. Ladies and gentlemen, we have uh, three of our MDA board of directors with us. And each of them will have an opportunity to, to say a few words. Um, John Rood former OSD policy, DOD. He is a prominent uh, leader at highest positions at State Department, the CIA, the uh, White House, the National Security Council. And he's also been on two major defense in industry groups, Raytheon and Lockheed. He comes with a wealth of information and wisdom. He was engaged with the indo pacific most of his time when he was serving under the previous president. Ladies and gentlemen, John Root. Well, thank you, Ricky, for that, that great introduction. There's no way I could live up to that one. <laughs> but, but thank you for, for saying that. Um, 
it's a pleasure to be with the with the other members of the panel. You've got a great group together, and it's at a right time to talk about this because I think as as uh, General Gibson was talking, the threat from China and the scale of it, the rapidity, the complex nature of the evolution of that threat is something we we just can't lose sight of. And I think the biggest concern I have about where we stand is we're recognizing as an enterprise, a, a defense institution in the Defense Department, the military services, and the, and the collective body that supports them in industry, the importance of it, but it's nowhere near the pace that it, it needs to be at, paced by the, the relevancy of the threat. And, you know, we've got to move at the speed of relevance. And if we were engaged in, a, in combat, which could be very shortly down the road, based on the trends you're seeing in the Pacific, we're not moving fast enough, and, and we will not uh, look back in history at our own performance and grade ourselves well if, if we don't step it up here. Because the reality is um, we're still a little behind. For example, you, you start at the top in my old role, what is our policy? And that's paced by the threat. You start with an assessment of the threat, and you start with a clear strategy and a character of the force to deal with that threat. But in missile defense, as an example, it's still being interpreted that North Korea is the pacing threat that animates most of our activities, not China, not Russia. Uh, and we're not as, a, as an organization being overt and explicit that the requirement to defend against large scale missile attack from China on our forces in the region and in the United States is an explicit requirement and it's something we've got to make a priority. I know that sounds very fundamental, but that's not in place yet. And then the pace at which we're moving with uh, projections, for example, Admiral Hill, uh, the director of the Missile Defense Agency testifying, he was hoping to have some initial capability in place in the early 2030s, uh, according to public testimony. Well, that, that's just simply not, not going to meet the need date. And I think history won't look well at, at us as a collective if we don't really improve that pace. Um, there are some things that are in place and you know, on the good news front, uh, you know, as General Thomas was reminding us before, uh, you know, we came on the air here, there has been a lot of progress. And if you kind of go down, what does it take for our, our enterprise and the Defense Department to respond to a threat? You got to understand that threat. You have to have a strategy and policy in place. That drives your operational military plans. Those are also in place. That drives your requirements. There are clear requirements that have been established here for the Defense of Guam. There's a program of record. Um, but we've gotten to the stage that while initial budgets have been requested from the Hill, we're, we're behind in the execution already and roles and responsibilities haven't been set out. And so if I was going to, uh, you know, offer advice to the people in charge of the Pentagon today, it'd be one, the pace at which we're moving is not fast enough. And it's easy. And I was in that in roles like that to be defensive and say, I'm working fast. I'm doing things fast. But the real pacing item is how are you competing against the threat? Um, and is that reasonable or unreasonable? That's not that's not the, the right metric. The right metric is, are you moving at the speed of relevance to deal with the security conditions? And I don't think anybody would agree we are. And then with that, the roles and responsibilities have recently been established for some components of the system, as you were just talking to General Gibson, but not sufficiently. And what's going to make this really complex is usually the programs and efforts in our military that struggle is when it involves more than one player and it crosses lines of responsibility. And that's where leadership is required. Uh, here you've got a, a Navy system, Aegis Ashore, that's typically operated at sea and then on land is staffed by sailors. You've got the Missile Defense Agency as the overarching architect for some of it, but there's a seam there in that the Army has been given the lead role for cruise missile defense. And what's required in Guam is the full spectrum of capabilities, all the way at the high end from hypersonic threats and ballistic missile threats down to cruise missile threats and counter UAS, because all will be employed in a conflict uh, by China or others. And if we, if we recognize, and for those that haven't spent a lot of time in the Pacific, as General Gibson said, it's vast. And there are a limited number of operating locations, and Guam is just central to us. It's not hardly surprising to me that 50, 60, 70 years later, after uh, you were talking about Admiral Nimitz being headquartered there, that we still regard it as vital because when you look around at the other real estate that there is for options, 
it really drives you to a limited number of locations. So we're going to have to fight and defend from Guam, and we're going to have to recognize the strategic importance of it. Um, so there, there are these themes. I think coming back and delivering capabilities in, say, the early 2030s, again, will not be good enough. And that's the objective in the year 2023. For those of us that have been involved in a lot of defense programs, when you are hoping to deliver capability in 10 to 12 years, the realistic outcome is something more like 15. Um, you're simply not going to get there unless we move faster. And doing accelerated acquisition requires changes in the system. Whenever we've had to surge, whether it's the creation of the Missile Defense Agency initially to meet a threat that was looming from North Korea, or it's the counter IED fight, or the shipment of MRAPs to the field for the fight during the, uh, the wars in Iraq and elsewhere, it required expedited and streamlined authorities and clear lines of responsibility back from the very top with the Secretary of Defense and Deputy fully behind it. So we've got to get to that level and these seams between the different capabilities and between the different services and organizations have to be worked on an ongoing basis. And it's a, almost the sort of thing you've got to have a council of leaders established to sit on top of with a single point at the top of that pyramid, typically the deputy secretary, to drive it on a, a daily basis. Um, I do think we're also not opening the full trade space of the defense space, and we've got to begin to include space-based capabilities much more fully in this equation. The high, ultimate high ground of space has got to be employed to much greater effect for the missile defense mission, in my view, and those things are nascent. Uh, dealing with hypersonic threats and other things, you're not going to do that simply from the ground or from uh, sea-based assets. Um, and so I don't think there's enough of a, a recognition of that that I'm seeing as well. But, you know, on the good news front, real budgets are, are available. The certain decisions have been made. And so, you know, as, as uh, Ty Thomas was reminding us, progress has been made. But I think we've got to really recognize and, and with speed and urgency adopt the lessons that we're seeing um, come out so forcefully in the conflict in Ukraine and elsewhere, where missiles are the primary instrument of warfare and, and UAS being implied very heavily on the battlefield. Um, defense is important. I do think that offensive capabilities need to be a part of this also. General Gibson uh, you know, highlighted that, whether it's sea lanes of control with land forces playing an increased role or the ability to counter-strike. And I, I hope that we will also break down more of those barriers between offense and defense in our defense doctrine, and more importantly, in application between the services. Uh, so with that, that's probably enough hey, for me to set the table. I'm happy to take questions. Yeah, no, John, you're on it. The time is perfect for roles and responsibilities. We, that, we, this is perfect. And it needs to be so we can mass up. We can mass, each of the services can mass up. MDA's budget can't do it all. I, I one question for you. Are we limited in policy and space to dominate that? And the second question, because we are doing hypersonic defense against most likely hypersonic nuclear weapons from China on US territory, is that now a shift to our bigger strategy on US homeland to have that same capability? I think we're still self-limiting ourselves in space and in the in the integration between offense and defense. Um, and I think we're we're there's good movement. For instance, the stand up of the space force and the issuance by General Salzman of the first doctrine that the space force have is a, is a big step forward over that which existed previously. And that's one of the good things you get from a service very focused on how do I how do I fight and win in a certain domain. And so. I, you know, I want to commend them for taking those steps, but I still think we're short of that because I, I think we have to begin really walking the walk that the space domain is like the air domain, like the land domain, like the sea domain. It's another area for competition and our, our potential adversaries are competing very vigorously, whether we want to, you know, fully acknowledge that publicly or not. And the difficulty that we face versus a, a closed society like China or others is unless we as Americans operate very openly in our system and describe our objectives and describe our progress. And in our system, what works best is to be self-critical too, where we find shortfalls. And, and we're not doing that. 
um, I don't think that we're clearly recognizing the offensive nature that has to be a character of warfare that will also apply to space uh, and integrating those efforts, not as a supporting arm, but another arm of the service where at times you're going to be supported and other times support team. We do that in the air and sea and land domains very seamlessly, but we are reluctant to do that in space, still mostly describing it as a support function as opposed to another area like the air domain, the land domain, the sea domain, where we will operate similarly. So I think we're still limiting ourselves there. We're reluctant to say we do any kind of weapons in space or even the terminology is concerning. Uh, and I think we need to be less concerned about that. Thank you. Um, our next guest is uh, Lieutenant General Retired, Ty Thomas. He is the DCOM, the Deputy Commander for the uh, United States Air Force Pacific. He's brilliant. Ladies and gentlemen, Ty. Ty Thomas. All right, great. Thank Ricky. You're, you're far too complimentary in the introductions, at least for me, but but uh, glad to be part of the panel. Um, <clears throat> good to see you out there in your uh, your fine office there, Brian, and uh, right next to the pac -Amp headquarters. So um, you, you guys have hit on, you know, one of the, I think, reasonable points for us to point out is that because we're all, NDAA is an advocate. We're always advocating for do this faster, sooner, better. Uh, but there has been a lot of progress made in the last year. And so I, I think, you know, a little bit of kudos. First of all, I mean, Admiral Aquilino and his team at indo um, uh, General Gibson, the team, General Flynn, General Wilsbach, they've all been pushing really, really hard, pack fleet. So let's give them credit. There's been people on the Hill that have taken this seriously um, and, and put their weight behind it. Mark knows those people very, very well. Um, and then, you know, MDAA gets a little bit of credit and others who've been pushing from the outside. So, all that said, we have so, so far to go, and this discussion kind of is, is clearing out the air on a lot of those things. So first point is to, to touch on something that you and John both hit on, which is, okay, no, I mean, the title of this conversation, no time to lose, no time to waste, no time to dither. We've already had our dithering time, okay? That's been the past decade. No more dithering. My point on that, is, and I think, you know, I'll use a phrase, which is default to fielding. What do I mean by that? So there's all kinds of systems that are going to be required, as John kind of laid out from the very high end against, you know, glide phase maneuvering, but all the way down to the very low end on counter SUAS um, and the lessons learned from what you can do with a 40 millimeter grenade and a DJI quadcopter in Ukraine. That should have our attention. But my point there is that many of those systems do exist, right? That's already there. Patriot's a capable system. We're going to have instances of if pick. The Army's taken far too long. Um, and we are going to get instantiations, even if the test plays out well in December of 2024. My whole point there is, is that if we're not quite exactly sure how every single thing fits together, that should not hold us back from fielding capability. We should get it on the island, start to make the use of it, and improve it over time. If, if we haven't noticed in the news, um, the charts that were provided as part of the um, environmental uh, impact study, guess where they've been showing up? News articles in Asia, news articles in the PRC. I would submit that just the release of the fact that we have a plan and we're discussing it and has funding has somewhat of a deterrent effect already. I don't want to overplay that, but it, it should be noticeable to us that there's a reaction to that. Um, Second thing is let's not lose sight of the fact that every time we make some progress on defending Guam and the second island chain, I'll come back to that in a sec, um, we actually do free up some offensive capability in the sense that everything we can do that can untether an Aegis BMD uh, destroyer cruiser puts us in a position to put some offensive capability further forward. That is exactly what the PAC fleet commander wants and what the Indom PACOM commander wants because it gives them options. And so let's not lose sight of that as we incrementally even field some capability that we're going to gain some offensive capability that we otherwise had to hold back. Um, you know, John made the point about uh, the varying levels of the threat, and I would say the solution is layered. We all know that. I mean, the IMD community understands that well. Um, the, uh, the, the point I want to make, though, is and, and I know our focus is here on Guam, but I think we've got to understand that the second island chain is a system, and particularly the Marianas is a system. 
And we've had some successes in doing launch on remote and be able to disaggregate sensors and, and effectors and all the various things. And that environment in the Marianas is rich for being able to do that. And if we're able to spread the pattern beyond Guam to the type of things that our opponent is gonna go after, that's winning for us. That's winning because they have to expend more capability to try to degrade the advantage that we're creating by defending Guam and the Marianas. So I, I think that's important and maybe we can talk about it a little bit more in, in question and answer. Um, last thing that I'll really touch on is, is the, the pointing out, that maybe it's the obvious, but is that an entire system, not just layered, but it's composed of four parts. And so you obviously you have sensors and those sensors can sense from multiple domains in multiple ways. And the discussion about space is fascinating, not just about, you know, our sensors, but oh, by the way, we should care about their sensors and their ability to see what we're doing on Guam and can we do anything about their sensing. But so we have sensors, we have effectors, our own, okay, and then we have C2 systems themselves. This discussion about, okay, is IBCS, C2 BMC, Aegis, all those things, that has to happen. And then you have to actually employ command and control. And that last part often gets um, set aside in our fascination associated plans, programs, budgets. But it's equally as important. And the point that I'll make and I'll close with on C2 is, is that um, this problem has been thought through. Uh, and I don't mean just specifically to Guam. I'm talking about integrated air missile defense. Um, and it's been tried and tested in multiple different combat environments. That doctrine should be our guide. That doctrine that drives organization and authorities. And if we need to deviate from it, we should. But we should clearly understand exactly why we're going to deviate from it. Um, sometimes I think that gets lost in the discussion and, uh, um, it, it, it bears the same level of careful scrutiny as it does with building out the architecture itself. So hopefully that helps. And I really look forward Thanks, to the, the questions over yeah. time. Um, Ty, I'd like you to give us a, um, a perspective of why the Air Force has got an ACE agile combat strategy for the for the second island chain or first island chain and it, why haven't they been more involved with the buildup of this Guam architecture? It seems like it's just the Army and the Navy on top of this and the Air Force is watching it when, they're, when they have that legitimate ability or requirement of the Army to defend their new airships wherever they put it. And the second thing, just touch a little bit on if we don't have a dirigible up there, how many sorties you got to do for 24-7 to be able to do, and how, and is that wasteful, or do we need to have the dirigible or an overhead persistent over a bunch of aircraft to do that? Wow. All right. Well, two whopper questions. I mean, the first one's got a lot to unpack there, but, but I would say that um, on agile common employment and other components have some, you know, the Marines have expeditionary air base operations, um, and uh, the Navy's got distributed maritime operations, but the whole the principle behind those is that no matter how good we are or become, I'll, I'll, you know, it's a future state, we're never going to have enough active defenses to be able to counter the saturation threat that we're talking about coming from the PRC. So you have to develop passive means. That's one of our four pillars at IMD, right? So in this case, agile common employment is an Air Force solution for passive means. And it is dispersal, not just to survive, but dispersal to continue to operate and operate effectively. And so um, I wouldn't first say that the first order reason why the airport's doing agile common employment because somebody isn't doing their job. I think it's because the environment and the threat demands it. Now, having said that, I mean, kind of weaved in there was a question, well, who provides all the capabilities and why isn't the Air Force more in involved in it? I would say the Air Force has been very involved in it. And the Air Force is responsible for and provides the capability for a key portion of air and missile defense, especially against cruise missiles, and that's airborne assets for sensing. And also, you know, it, you do might have to find yourself chasing down a cruise missile with an F-15 or an F-22. Hopefully it never comes to that. But oh, by the way, part of that defense is also maintaining the forward DCA lane so an H-6 bomber never gets in a position to launch a volley of cruise missiles. If they never launch the volley of cruise missiles, guess what? Everything's still in the magazine back in the second island chain. Um, nonetheless, there's uh, uh, the vast majority of this capability we're talking about comes from the Army and the Navy. Uh, and so they've got to have a lead role in this. There's unquestionably about that. 
Um, and then the uh, the second question there, Ricky, just a quick reminder, because I was uh, unpacking so deep. Just overhead one. persistent, the yeah. demand on the Air Force aircraft to do that. The to, to me, that's a no-brainer. I mean, we have got to find a way to, to provide that um, look down inside the air domain uh, that's going to give us, uh, you know, advantage on, on targeting the inbounds. And if we're going to try to do it by consuming, you know, the E3, uh, I, I'll just say that we can, I can question whether that's even useful at all, but the E7 could, except that where do we need the E7 forward? characterizing the air domain so that we can control the air domain in the places that we need to so that we can put the initiative against the opponent and keep them from gaining initiative going back to like that h6 example so um whether they're fixed whether they're mobile ricky you know like a yeah. blimp or something really don't care need to have it over okay thanks todd all right ladies and gentlemen i love this guy graduated from Penn, <laughs> oxford and, and got a nuclear uh School out of out of the U.S. Navy. He is uh, the former uh, three, the former head of ops for PayCal. He's also the senator, our Senate's top guy on cyber. Um, great, great guy. Mark, it's all yours. Mark McGovern. Hey, thanks, Ricky. Brian, good to see you. And uh, John and John, good to follow. Um, the uh, I'll make it quick. You know, I think there's a the bad news here is that you know I think DoD's kind of cluster leaped this up uh, this challenge for the past seven years. And, um, and and really you know, all the way back to when it was pushed by Paycom in the 2016 PDI. The good news is I still think we're in a good position to have a useful initial operating capability at the end of 2024 and, and something we can build off of starting in 2025. So, and I think that has to do with the Army and Navy having systems that we've generated for other purposes that we can repurpose here and make work. It's just gonna take a lot of integration and so having uh, one group in, in charge is good. You know, I, I will say, you know, um, I, I, uh, I'm glad that we have General Flynn, right, the A, A person designated in, in charge of this. I think the, the Navy should have been the person, but they aggressively tried not to be. And, uh, and you should not pick someone who aggressively tries not to do something because they'll just screw it up all the way home. Um, I mean, if we'd said, I, I think that we're going to, end up with a with a system that takes uh, that basically our initial operating capability is going to be a spy radar with a Aegis C2, uh, a VLS, and then bring in from the Army MRC launcher and, and Navy weapons, SM6, SM3, and, and then bring in from the Army the MRCs and then THAAD. And we may be able to populate it with a little bit of extremely expensive and painful Patriot, but we may not. Um, and look, that is not the perfect system, but it's something we can immediately begin to demonstrate and show the Chinese that we're serious about the defense of Guam and that we can generate elements of this in other areas where necessary. I think the real challenges for us is getting to a cost-effective cruise missile system uh, to beat a dead horse if pick is always two years away from being two years away. I was actually listening to the House Armed Services Committee staffers tell me the Army's told us they're on track. They made their decision not to push for a NASAVs, and then as soon as that was buttoned up, the Army announced we're on a two-year delay, which is, you know, pretty common. I, I don't want to be brutal here, but if pick is very, very late to need, and I suspect at some point we're just going to transition from a kinetic if pick to a directed energy if pick, and we're not two years away from that. We're even farther for cruise missile defense, and, and I just think Navy systems and the Patriot are too expensive right now on their exchange rates of, of uh outgoing defensive missiles for incoming offensive missiles. We've, it would be great if we could settle on some NASAMs. We apparently think that's good enough for Kiev and Lviv and Odessa. Um, it'd be nice if we could push them out there. It's good enough to defend the White House, Capitol Hill, and the Pentagon. I think it's good enough for Anderson. Um, but you know, that's the Anderson Air Force Base in Guam. I would really push for that. I would add that into what I think the Army is going to design as in a, you know, that initial IOC I talked about, which I do think the good news, we can still get there. The other thing I'd add is what Ricky and Ty was just referred to is dirigibles. Uh, we don't have to call it J-Lens if there's some kind of like, you know, sclerotic reaction to that word in the services. But, uh, you know, I, I do think we need a persistent medium to high altitude. In fact, J-Lens isn't perfect. I would want something up at 50 to 70,000 feet, honestly. I'd also want something not tied to a, uh, uh, to a cable eventually, because I'd like to get the hell out of Dodge if I'm in Guam. Um, but I'd like something that's really looking down and just 
as as Ty implied, knocking, you know, removing hundreds, if not a thousand sorties by E7, E3, E2D, and other aircraft uh, doing suboptimal look. And look, one thing I know about Army and Navy missiles, they're t they're significantly more effective when they get firing track quality data from a al high altitude source. We've seen that with the new E2D. We'll, we see it when we work with the wedge tail from the Australians, and we'll see it with the U.S. Air Force's wedge tail when they get out there. And we would we saw it with J lens when we had it, um, and we'll see it again when I think with a dirigible. I think the and the beauty of this is we have the Israelis like op testing some new systems for us out in the Negev desert right now. So I think we're we're in a really good position on that. So if we could add that low cost cruise missile defense, add the the dirigibles, I think we've got the VLS MRC. That's the vertical launch system, and the uh, the the uh, truck based launchers that the Army provides. And a good mix of that. I think we could be in a very healthy place with one exception. This will be my final thing. So there's bad news and good news. There is one piece of very bad news, and that's hypersonic defense. And this goes beyond you know, the defense of Guam issue. This is a problem inside our government where we are very good at continuing to work on good news stories. In other words, we're catching up on the offensive side. We've got the Army, Navy, and Air Force. I'm, I'm, I'm surprised the Marine Corps haven't suddenly developed a hypersonic weapon. You know, but we've got the Army, Navy, and, and Air Force kicking butt, developing a hypersonic weapon to catch up with the Chinese and pass, I'm sure, the Chinese and Russians on offense. The problem is we're a democracy. That's not a problem, but the fact is we're a democracy. And we're, we're, we're fighting an autocracy who has the first mover advantage. And uh, so we have our defense needs to be good as the Chinese offense. We don't want them to have a capability for which we don't have a deterrent response, a, a, a deterrent capability. And by that, I mean a defensive capability in hypersonics. And I'm really worried that it sounds like we're spending about 12 to 14% on hypersonic defense. This is in the non-black programs as we are in the hypersonic offense. That's a real mismatch. And I get the feeling that we just don't have a best of breed to bet on. And in the absence of that, we're not. And we're going to wait till, I think I've heard a few times it's been mentioned here, 2035. I think the Chinese are going to hit hypersonic offensive capability before 2035. I've seen the Chinese move to the left in procurement. I've seen the United States kind of universally move to the right in procurement, you know, in terms of timeline. So I'm really worried about that delta. So we really got to get at that. If there's one thing I would say get at, and this is not for the Defense of Guam team. This is for the Missile Defense Agency for the team. whole thing, yeah. Uh, yeah, for the whole thing, and the, and it applies to the de defense of the homeland as well. So, Ricky, those are my kind of big thoughts. Again, very achievable. I'm excited to see Charlie Flynn's team tackle this, but what they're going to achieve is based on systems that exist already. Yeah. What, from your perspective, Mark, how do we, how do you put major pressure to get this out the door? when you're going to see a couple of these things slowing down? Is it through Congress? Is it through the DEPSEC? How do we get urgency? Is it the culture that's there? We've got to get this urgency back. I mean, we've been doing very limited stuff and oversight well, that's from, why, like, from North Korea. So, look, it's, I was very unhappy with how CAPE handled this. I mean, I'm, I'm not like the House Republicans who want to defund CAPE unhappy, but I'm unhappy. I think assigning it, uh, to uh, to the, uh, the Undersecretary of Defense for the acquisition, and to the uh, to the Army uh, to coordinate and move out. You know, to to be the service lead on that is probably at this point they're the only services who didn't step one step back when they asked for volunteers. So you know, I think the Army you know, having the Army do this is the right. It is the only sense. Look, Congress has a sense of urgency about this. They just don't know the right answer, right? And they shouldn't. Just like CAPE didn't know the right answer, and they shouldn't. I think if the Army works closely with the Missile Defense Agency, we'll get to the and pay, U.S. Pacific Command. They'll get to the right answer, but there does need to be a sense of urgency about it, and that's what I heard from General Gibson. Mark, do you want to open up the questions and, and pass them around to, to, to yeah, the team? Yeah, I'll go with the first one. Um, the uh, uh, the uh, I'll go right to Brian first since we have a guest on here. Uh, what do you see as the best mix of sensors and weapons to defend Guam? And do you think directed energy could play a role within the next five years? Yeah, so, um, you know, the, the principal 
doctrinally of layering and tailoring defenses between sensors and shooters to include the persistent overhead sensing you, you all have talked about. Um, I think that today's design based on capabilities available and threats that we see is appropriate uh, for GLOB minus the overhead persistent side. Um, because building something new that we haven't already built and approved is just gonna be further and further to the right, um, quite frankly, with decisions that are unmade. So I think we're in a, we're in a pretty good spot um, from a capabilities perspective, minus the, the timing. Um, directed energy, I think, um, I think as Ricky said, he saw the, the, the army truck for an eventual huge laser um, for 300 kW. Those are, those are certainly activities that um, our rapid capabilities office with General Rash is working very hard on with other partners to include um, joint partners, Navy and, and Air Force. Do I think it has a part to play in the next five years? I think regardless of when lasers come on the battlefield from tactical to operational, as long as they are from the first, from the very get go, um, embedded into the command and control systems of record that we are going to employ on Guam, then yes, we could employ direct energy lasers um, on Guam. Not part of today's plan, could be tomorrow's plan, but if we keep the same C2 systems, our um, Aegis weapon system, IBCS, whatever it is, we keep those and eliminate that as a future variable, then I think we don't artificially restrict our ability to employ them in the future. Does that make sense, Mark? Hey, Brian, what about the doctrine? I mean, have we even invested in how to, all the rules to fire a laser around? Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's got to be some time and effort. And, and who's shooting and who's training to shoot it? It still seems a long ways away. But Yeah, it certainly is an activity with, your, with time in front of us, but it's more than just paper deep now from an Army perspective, and it's parochial just because I know it. But from an Army perspective, we're filled in our fourth, prototype 50 kW laser at Fort Sill as we speak in the hands of operators to operate with a maneuver formation from the Army to learn. Now that's the tactical side of it, right? It, it's, it's a little bit different than a non-maneuvering island in the Pacific, um, but the principles remain the same. There's an approval process at the OSD level that has to get approved to allow us to employ lasers on the battlefield. Um, and then there's a whole bunch of procedures based on the operating environment um, to get it down to the operating level effective. I know this, lasers are still just another arrow in the quiver. And we have a tactical C2 system, mainly by the air component, went over land and big spa spaces of air into the maritime domain, um, predominantly in defense of the fleet that can handle the introduction of lasers to clear airspace, to get decisions made, uh, and then to make sure they're effective. But that's not a today thing. And what they, and I, I, next question is for John, but one quick thing I'd add on, and I agree with everything Brian said, I'd add on that we, the good news, Ricky, is Thad and Aegis know exactly how to work together. And if you throw Patriot in, Thad, Aegis, and Patriot do. And in fact, on occasion, they can make each other operate better. And you know, you can't, you don't want to sell that down. And like I said, all of them could easily take a Jay Lynch hook or something else. Um, hey, for, uh, for, for John, what's the role of the Missile Defense Agency? Is there anything we could do to make them more effective in this process? Well, Missile Defense Agency has been identified as the overall systems architect for ballistic missile defense and hypersonic missile defense. But where there's a seam I see that's pretty big in the roles and responsibilities is that Army's been designated the lead service for uh, cruise missile defense and counter UAS. Now, you may think, well, okay, you shoot one missile at one target and a different missile at the other, but the command and control relationship, and when a battle's unfolding, the enemy's not going to patiently, you know, sequence their fires. They're going to <laughs> integrate them. And, and so I worry a lot about the command and control software and the capability for commanders to manage the fight between the, the battle management command and control system that MDA manages and the Army's IFPIC. So what I what I would you know recommend is that the leadership appoint the MDA to be the overall systems architect to include the integration of the Army system into the BMC cubed. I think Army is going to have its hands full with the amount of, of work that it's going to have to do already 
with the um, uh, development for the lower tier defenses. And so, I mean, that's that's one of the things I think that could be added. And I mean, like you, I'm very concerned. I've been watching this IBCS movie for a few years and the ending doesn't appear to be getting closer. And these these very large software jobs that, that we've had a history with in the Defense Department, uh, they often don't close. Uh, so I, I do think at some point we're going to have to um, architect some other solutions. But for now, uh, you know, I think it'd be enough for MDA to be appointed the overall uh, command and control systems architect to make the two systems work together better. But John, if they are, the, who's doing the production of the weapon system? That's where they don't have the budget to do that. And we don't have the role's responsibility to tell the services to go do that. So that's where it seems to be very dysfunctional on, on trade space for the service chiefs to give up the monk to do this without roles and responsibilities defined. Yes, and see, I think the clear roles and responsibilities, whenever you're doing a very large, complex system, I'm a big believer, You've got history shows, you gotta have a systems integrator, systems architect. And the decision's been made, and I, I think it's the right one, that the Missile Defense Agency has that role, both the decision made by the department as, as well as the Congress. But we don't walk that walk. And so when you're saying, well, they don't have the budget, well, that can easily be moved from the service or elsewhere into the account. The services fight that. But you have to have somebody in charge as the lead systems integrator. Uh, and when you don't, you pay more. I mean, you may think you're saving money, you don't. Uh, that's that's a hard lesson one that we learned that we, we should not fail to heed. But here uh, also the production for the early development, the roles and responsibilities of the department has established is that's the Missile Defense Agency's role. But for production of units, the services need to budget and account for that. And unfortunately, this has been kind of a 15, 20 year struggle. And ultimately you gotta have, um, you know, OSD enforce that kind of discipline, that that's, that's what's going to have to be done. Because I can see it from the point of view of the services and at various times, they have more programs, more needs than fit their budget. And so to the extent they can <laughs> cut back on some things or frankly have a little, little different prioritization, they will. Um, and you've got a lot of sympathy for them because again, they've got way more needs than they've got budget to account for. But that's where there's gotta be a prioritization and, uh, and typically above the service level to harmonize those things and to make them work together well. Hey, Ricky, we don't have much time left. I want to give uh, uh, Ty a question if you want. You got yeah, another I, question? Yeah, I got one for Ty. I was going to give Brian the final word after I ask Ty a question, all right? So, um, Ty, for you, um, this is a good Air Force one. It says, hey, do the data links we have now have the throughput range and latency required for missile defense platforms given the countermeasures we're starting to see from the adversary? That's the only PhD question we had in here, so we had that for the Air Force guy. Yeah, um, I don't know. I don't think I can provide a definitive answer on that. I, I would say, you know, this, that um, we found ways to make Link 16 work better and more than we thought that we could get it to work. Um, so there's that. But Link 16 just has some very fundamental structural limitations that I think we've got to be able to scale beyond. Um, the the other, I think, important point is that the, the various waveforms um, you know, are important and they also, they each have their own unique qualities, particularly to what they're trying to do. Um, you still have to bring them together. Okay, there is no waveform that rules them all. So um, I think part of the answer to the question is that we're still gonna find ourselves in some place where we're going to have to be doing uh, gateways like a bad word, okay? So, but, but a way to translate from one waveform to another to do it cleanly, to do it quickly, to do it effectively, and that's got to be part of this system in terms of the, the you know, as I use the, the C2 system element of the overall defensive system, systems of yeah. systems. So um, that's the best way I think I can touch it right now. That was a good answer. Of course, it makes me think if only the Air Force had embraced cooperative engagement capability in the 1990s. But I digress. Um, and, and also, I think it's interesting watching SDA, the Space Domain, uh, Space Defense Agency and Missile Defense Agency almost competitive and their launching of like that transport layer. You you see them like yeah. announcing almost the same things that could really enhance this capability going forward. 
It, true, uh, but I mean, even on that though, it's domain dependent. So you can, you're, it's the environment for being able to use LaserCom in space is a lot more benign than trying to do it terrestrially, right? Yeah. So even there, we're gonna we'll have huge gains, but they're going to be constrained somewhat by the domain. Over. Thanks, and I'm glad no one brought their pinky up to their lip saying laser. Uh, Brian, I want to give you a final word before Ricky closes us. Okay, thanks, sir. And obviously the least among all of you on this call. So, Ricky, thanks for the invite. Let me be part of it. Um, certainly Mahalo from General Thomas, your old headquarters. Um, and yes, it's still in about the same state of array. So, um, as we talk about timelines, but no, seriously, it's great to be part of this discussion. I, it, time matters, as you've all described. I sense it every day here. I feel the ton of questions that you can imagine along with the joint team here to try inside of government lines to um, make this as good and as quick as we can. Uh, but I say it's a team sport is what I started with up front. And that team is um, inside the department and outside the department for shared understanding and um, impact. So thanks to each of you, Ricky. Um, appreciate it. You want to go around? Because we're going to close. Go ahead. I, th I think you should close, Ricky. Yeah. Okay. I, I, so I think one of the strongest positions was done by Dan Cargler last week, the three star, the highest ranking Space Coast Defense Commander, who said our biggest need, our biggest challenge is capacity. Our our infrastructure that makes capacity is our challenge. That's what we have to shift into for this urgency to work. And we've got to play with what we've got till the silver bullets come in, but there's got to be urgency to play with what we've got and mass it until that time comes. And that is what we have to have to slow China down and to change that calculus. So I appreciate you guys coming in. We are going to continue to fight urgency of hitting this thing with what we've got instead of delaying this thing out 15 years or 20 years. We got to go get it. So thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for listening. And uh, half a day, aloha, and good afternoon. Thanks.